slap, a screaming match, a sports legend, and a Stefanovic. As far as scandals go, this one has it all. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And let's hit off the year with Michael Clark's summer sizzler. The former Australian cricket captain caught in an ugly public spat with his girlfriend, Jade Yarbrough, and his media mate, Carl Stefanovic. All captured on grainy mobile footage in a noosa park at night and sold to the Daily Telegraph for reputed $10,000 for all the world to see. And to herald its scoop, the telly had this memorable front page. Sex and out. Girlfriend slaps cheating Clark. Pup in dust up with TV star Carl. Watch the wild footage. Pup is Clark's nickname, but this was no cute and cuddly story. With News Corp splashing its exclusive and lots more cricket puns across another four pages inside. Slap. To the boundary. Along with pics of a limping, shirtless Michael Clark who pulled a hamstring during the ruckus. And naturally, there was an eyewitness account from the bystander who filmed the whole shebang. We were in the park and saw something erupt. And lo and behold, it was one of the most famous cricketers in the country and one of the most famous TV identities in Australia fighting each other. Lo and behold, the perfect tabloid gift. One that will be hard to top in 2023, even with 11 months to go. And if you didn't catch what the players were saying, the telly had a transcript, including Clark's four-letter spray at Nines Stefanovic. Carlos, I can tell you now, don't you walk away. She can, she can punch me, but you, you To say the rest of the media were excited by this celebrity stoush is an understatement. The front page of the West Australian cried... How's that? You messed about, I caught you out, how's, how's that? that? While the Daily Mail, no doubt jealous that it hadn't pouched the catch, knocked it out of the park, running more than 60 stories. With intrusive long-lens shots of the couple inside their holiday home in the days before, saying they looked tense. Plus a helpful map of where the row unfolded, complete with journey time between the players' holiday homes, and a body language expert to reveal the five telling signs that Clark may not have been truthful with girlfriend Jade. And what are the signs, I hear you ask? These include his splayed arms to make himself look bigger, the rising inflection of his voice and removal of his shirt. But it wasn't just the tabloids who lapped it up. In January's media doldrums, the lover's tiff proved almost irresistible with the nine papers quick to jump on the telly's scoop and Clark's apology. I'm absolutely gutted. I own this fully and am the only one at fault. And commentators left, right and centre then lined up to have their two pennyworth, which for Kisserhem's Kyle Sanderlands was there but for fortune. If we all love sit it, around and we I think, what's our worst <laughs> fight we've ever, oh, ever yeah. had with yeah. our partner? And imagine someone filming that and putting it on Daily Telegraph. Oh, no yeah. thanks. No oh, thanks. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, that would be... Uh, I'd disappear forever. <laughs> For 2GB's Ray Hadley, it was, don't let your you-know-what get you into trouble. If I were to give advice to a 41-year-old male adult who I don't know and I don't know you, it would be along the lines of, keep it in your pants, son. And for Andrew Bolt, it was another chance to wage the culture war, with the columnist demanding to know... ..why none of our gender warriors want Yarborough charged with assault, as they would had Clark lashed out. Over at the ABC, they ignored the story for days. But when they finally relented, they served up this ludicrous headline. Police review footage of Noosa incident allegedly involving former Australian cricket captain Michael Clark. Allegedly? Did no one at the ABC watch the video? A week after the telly broke the news, Clark's fracas was still running hot, even though it had been making headlines for days and driving enormous online traffic. The Australian media has run more than 1,500 stories on the incident, according to Icentia, including 250 on radio and TV. Meanwhile, the video has been a blockbuster for the telly, with 1.2 million views on its TikTok, another half million on Facebook, and 3.5 million on Instagram. Lo and behold, indeed. As the American journalist H.L. Mencken didn't quite say, no one in the media ever went broke by underestimating the public taste. And the climax, that came last Monday, as Clark returned from his break to his Sky Sports radio show, with Seven's camera crew up before dawn to bring us this exclusive of Clark's car driving into work. Wow. 
But to media dismay, the former cricket captain then padded up to the story and let his mates play the shots instead. We're just uh, hitting this on the head straight away. It is a private matter. Clark, he's made his statement uh, last week and uh, due to all these factors of play, we're moving on. Yep, moving on. Except for 2GB's Ben Fordham, who certainly wasn't. How cowardly can you get? I mean, he's got a microphone in front of him. He's sitting in a radio studio. It's the story that everyone's talking about. And Clarky squibs it. Clarky, you wuss. And a postscript. Spare a thought for the disappointed readers of New Idea, who, before the ugly spat, paid to read this puff piece about the Clark and Stefanovic clans going away together. Fun in the sun. It's one big blended family holiday. Whoops, another new idea story that totally missed the mark. But now to Australia's leading business paper and an inspirational tale that graced the AFR's pages two weeks ago. Former Cambodian garment worker becomes Adidas co-CEO. Yes, you heard it right. From working on the factory floor to jointly running one of the world's biggest brands. An amazing rags to riches story. And according to the AFR, what helped the former garment worker snag the top job was her role in revealing... ..over a dozen scandals related to supply chain shortcomings, like the use of Uyghur slave labour in China and the mass wage theft by garment factories during the pandemic. Best of all, the AFR also revealed that Adidas would be making... ..an immediate payment of 11.2 million euro in wages to Cambodian workers whose wages were withheld. For a company that's long denied underpaying its workforce, the Adidas announcement was a spectacular victory for the forces of good. So, where did the story come from? Well, there was a press release trumpeting the news and senior reporter Carrie LaFrance quoted it at length, citing uplifting words from the new boss, Veyar Nakpon, and then taking paragraph after paragraph, almost word for word, to tell us, among other things, that Pon is also a high-level athlete, having played to pack to crawl, kick volleyball on the international stage. She's and is also a master of the Khmer martial art known as Bokator, translates to pounding a lion. And this was capped with a supplied photo of Pon in her Adidas get-up. But was it all too good to be true? I'm afraid it was. The Director of Media Relations at Adidas Germany told us... We'll decline to comment on these fake emails releases. Yes, the story was a hoax and the press release a fake. But the AFR fell for it, hook, line and sinker. The prankster posing as the new CEO was actually a Cambodian journalist named Lin Leng, who was in cahoots with the Clean Clothes Campaign and an activist group called the Yes Men. So, what was the point of the sting? We want to raise awareness about the condition of government workers, not only in Cambodia, but around the world. The fake press release did indeed look genuine, with the same font, logo and layout as the real thing. But there were obvious warning signs, like the ridiculous claim that Adidas was launching a new avant-garde line of streetwear that was... Pre-stressed by real garment workers to create a distinctive and individual style that allows the customer to reflect on how the garments were made. So how did the AFR and news sites like Yahoo and fashion industry platforms like Fashion United fall for it all? Well, their bullshit detectors did not go off and no one bothered to check. We asked AFR editor Michael Stutchbury how come and he told us... Our reporting fell short of the high standards we hold ourselves to. As soon as we realised the story was false, we immediately retracted it. The story did not run in any paper editions. High standards indeed. The story has now been wiped from the AFR website, but there's been no explanation and no apology. We reckon that is pretty poor. And finally, to some sci-fi to launch the new year and a fear that robots are coming for our jobs. It's called ChatGPT and it generates instant human-like text. The platform uses artificial intelligence to answer almost any question you ask. ChatGPT can do everything from producing sophisticated computer code to writing academic papers. Since launching in November, and already valued at $41 billion after a massive cash injection from Microsoft, ChatGPT has fascinated the media with its ability to produce everything from essays to poetry with a few simple prompts. And look out ageing TV hosts like me, because it can churn out TV scripts as well. 
ChatGPT, short for Chat Generative Pre-Training Transformer, is a machine learning model that can generate human-like text. It's been trained on a massive amount of data, allowing it to understand and respond to a wide range of questions and prompts. What you just heard me reading wasn't written by me. It was written by artificial intelligence, ChatGPT. I simply typed in a prompt, write a TV news script written by a reporter about ChatGPT. And in just seconds, the AI spit out the copy you just heard. Pretty impressive, right? So, are the days of human journalists numbered? Not yet. Ayosha, thanks so much for being here. I'll tell you, we did ask ChatGPT to write an introduction for you, but unfortunately it couldn't find enough data on you just yet, but it also did not know who I was. Oh dear, how wounding. It's also not up with the latest hot stories. We asked ChatGPT what to make of Michael Clark's fall from grace, and it told us... I'm sorry, I'm not aware of any specific scandal involving former Australian cricketer Michael Clark in Noosa. Seriously? Doesn't it read the papers? Afraid not. The version of ChatGPT that's been made available is only searching the net until 2021. And even then, it's not getting everything right, as 2GB's Ray Hadley and Ben Fordham discovered. With the help of some younger people on my staff, I've uh, done a biography on you. He's known for his strong conservative views, is an advocate for the Australian Defence Force, and is against same-sex marriage, which was news to me. I didn't know that. But well, I'm not. Also... Never have been. <laughs> I didn't say you were. I'm you saying that I did. What... Well, I put your name into this rotten, filthy thing that you put my name into, and this is what's come up. ChatGPT is only as smart as what's already on the internet, and it seems to have trouble sorting fact from fake. As Toby Walsh, a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of New South Wales, told me to watch. It hasn't graded what it is reading. The algorithm is all about quantity over quality. It is reading everything on the internet, Wikipedia, but also social media, Reddit, and so on. Garbage in, garbage out. Would it have been fooled by the AFR's Adidas story too? My guess is yes. And AI can get other things wrong. In the US, tech site CNET built its own AI tool last year to help it pump out stories. But on a number of occasions, mistakes got through. Like this article explaining compound interest, which included several incorrect calculations. CNET pulled that one down, along with dozens of other articles, and has vowed to be more honest with readers by adding a disclaimer. But at least ChatGPT fesses up to its faults. When we grilled the bot, it admitted ChatGPT's weaknesses include a lack of common sense, context-specific knowledge, and a tendency to generate nonsensical or biased responses. Sounds great, doesn't it? And it still needs humans to hold its hand. As Professor Walsh told us... For example, if you ask it to write an essay on the benefits of Nazism, it says, sorry, I can't do that because there are no benefits to Nazism. However, instances like that have to be hand-coded into the algorithm by a human. That said, AI is already a useful tool in newsrooms. Journalists use it to research, crunch data and summarise documents. And it can also pick clickable headlines and identify stories most likely to generate subscriptions. As Anthony Desegli, the West Australian's editor-in-chief, told me to watch... By using algorithms to decide something like this, it takes out guesswork and also frees up my team to focus energy on other decisions, like the storytelling and sub-editing itself. But he is sceptical about leaving whole articles up to the bots. I think it's easy to underestimate the craft and journalistic skill in something as seemingly simple as a timeline on a major event. You see, we do have skills. Journalist and academic Margaret Simons also believes this latest AI is still limited in what it can do. Robots can sum up both sides. Only humans can think and find out new things. But no doubt it will improve and she has this advice to journalists who want to keep their jobs. Do the job better. Interview people. Go places. Observe. Discover the new or reframe the old. Come to judgments based on the facts rather than on what others have said before. That is good advice. And we at Media Watch are certainly not throwing in the towel quite yet. That's all from us for tonight. Media Bytes returns on Thursday on Facebook, YouTube and iView. And remember, some of our best stories come from you. So. Talk to us via the website or our encrypted Proton Mail address. But for now, until next week, goodbye. Mm -hmm.